Um, let us then ask ourselves, uh, shall we, how the Sabbath should be kept. Briefly, a few passages of Scripture. First of all, Exodus 16, verse 23. Exodus 16, verse 23. Please note that though Mosaic, this is pre-Sinaitic. So what we're reading here is not part of the ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross, which ceremonial law is only recorded from Exodus 21 onwards. Uh, Exodus 16, verse 23. And he said unto them, Moses said to the people, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and sieve that ye will sieve. And that which remaineth over, lay up for you to be kept until the morning. First principle, no unnecessary food preparation on the Lord's day. Do it the day before. Verse 29, See for, see, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the six days the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Second principle, don't engage in unnecessary travel on the Lord's day, particularly traveling to go around looking for food in Howard Johnson's or McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> Next. This is a hard saying, is it not? <laughs> Next, shall we turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations, Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. I can't tolerate it. It's iniquity. Even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Why? Verse 17. Learn to do well. Learn to keep the commandments. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Third principle, on the Sabbath day particularly, but on the other days also, keep the Ten Commandments, all ten of them. Isaiah 56, verse 2. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the Son of Man that layeth hold on it. And that is, verse 1, Keep ye judgment, and do justice. Keep the Ten Commandments. Blessed is the man, verse 2, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Fourth principle, don't pollute the Sabbath. Don't, don't waste your time sitting in front of the boob tube, alias the idiot box, alias the television, watching programs that bring you in the flesh on the Lord's day instead of in the spirit. This is a hard saying too. Isaiah 58, the last two verses, beginning verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And now, eschatologically, God will prosper us on earth. And when we get to the new earth, why, we'll saddle up a brontosaurus and leap around from one peak to the other. I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. 
course, riding the Bronco will be on days other than the Sabbath. <laughs> May I ask, um, in that same chapter, there's quite a bit of, about uh, not going into sackcloth and ashes and loosing the bonds of wickedness. Would, would you care to make any comment on that? Very gladly, after 20 minutes to 11. And uh, I doubt I'll have time to say what I want to say, but I'd be pleased to do that later. But I'll make a few observations about verse 13. We are not to grind the Sabbath under our foot. We're not to lord it over the Sabbath. Christ lords it over the Sabbath. It's his day. He's lord of the Sabbath, and we submit to it. Second, we're not to do our pleasure on his day. Things that can wait till Monday. This doesn't mean, and I think this is the point you were making, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't have joy and pleasure in the Sabbath. Sure, the Lord doesn't want us to wear sackcloth because that rubs the wrong way, irritates the flesh. But the Sabbath is made for the Lord's pleasure, and our pleasure we should only experience in doing the things that are pleasurable to the Lord. Third, we should positively call the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor him. Hebrew says honor it, which may even refer to the day, not only the one whose day it is. Not doing our own ways, go watch the ball game, it's our own way, the Lord's day, nor finding our own pleasure, nor speaking our own words. Come out of church and we discuss politics, art, science, literature, everything under the sun, our own words, except the word of God, which we've just heard. And we're all guilty of this, I am too. Okay, let's move on. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 19. Thus saith, said the Lord unto me, Jeremiah, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah and, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. What's this, the fifth or the sixth principle? Denounce the state and the state official that desecrate the Sabbath, even if it's the king. Require the state to close the gates, the public places, on the Lord's Day. Address yourself to the whole people regarding the requirements of keeping the Sabbath. And don't pick up weights, particularly weights intended to, for trade, and ship them around on the Lord's Day. That means if you operate a chain store, try and get all your foodstuffs in on Saturday night so you don't move cargo across country on the Lord's Day because you're causing people to work unnecessarily. It's a matter of necessity, do it. But don't make things that aren't a necessity a matter of necessity if you can get it done on Saturday. But they obeyed not, verse 23, and uh, neither did they incline their ear, but they made their neck stiff, so that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, said the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and horses, the eschatological blessing previously mentioned in Isaiah 58. But conversely, if we don't do this, Verse 27, If you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates, the public places of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Luke 23, the very last verse, Second last verse. The women too who came with him from Galilee, came with Jesus from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. 
as Jesus had taught them, who, as his custom was, went to the house of the Lord in the Lord's day and kept it. Now, upon the first day of the week, on the first day of the new Sabbath, Leotone, Sabbathone, Sunday, they came to the graves. The Sabbath continues, as indeed we're told the Sabbath continues, in Hebrews 4, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest, a sabbatismos, a repeated keeping of the Sabbath rest to the people of God, even after they are saved. And then, of course, finally, Revelation 1, verse 10, where John says, and notice he's all alone on the island of Patmos. There's nobody else with him. He can't worship with anybody, but he's still conscious of it being the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, which as we saw means Sunday Sabbath. He wasn't in the flesh on the Lord's Day. He was in the Spirit. Now, in spite of constant departures from the pure scriptural doctrine of the Sabbath, um, it was necessary for great Reformed theologians to call the people of God after the Reformation back to scriptural Sabbath keeping. And here I'll just mention some names. I wish I had a couple of hours, but I don't. Think of the great John Owen. If you haven't got his commentary on Hebrews, get it. And pour and memorize and commit to heart every word that he writes in his treatment of Hebrews chapter 4. May I commend to you the great Puritan Richard Baxter, particularly his little book, The Saint's Everlasting Rest, in which he says, Use your Sabbaths as steps to glory until you have there arrived. May I point you to Hodge's systematic theology, particularly his treatment of the fourth commandment there, to A. A. Hodge's little book on, uh, on this matter, and also to a little booklet of John Murray's that I hadn't seen before until Professor Knight drew it to my attention yesterday. I'll quote from it a little later. Well, the, all of these are written in English so they're accessible to you, but I'd like to share with you a number of excellent Reformed works that are not in English. First of all, I want to point to the great Futius. Now, Futius was one of the greatest covenantal theologians that has ever lived, and he utterly crushed and demolished the dispensationalist Cocceius uh, in Holland. And, of course, that's still the issue today in our circles. Shall covenant theology triumph, or shall dispensational theology triumph? That's the issue. Shall Futius triumph or Cocceius? I hope the Covenant Theological Seminary will triumph in this matter. Now, Futius says, and I'd like to draw a few things that he said uh, to your attention. He was a man, by the way, who knew everything about everything. Just about all languages and sciences and mathematics and incidentally theology. He said in his De Sabato et Festis concerning the Sabbath and the feasts, that there must be a stated day of rest for the Christians. He held this against dispensationalists and Unitarians. Second, that the Jewish Sabbath on the seventh day has been altered and abolished. This he held against the Jews. That this alteration took place by divine right and not by ecclesiastical tradition. This he held against Romanists. Fourth, that the Lord's Day derives not merely from tradition, but from Scripture. This he also held against Romanists. Fifth, that Sabbath observance does not exclude works of mercy. This he held against the Jews. Sixth, that not only servile works are forbidden, but also everything that hinders the public and private divine service, eredinst, this he held against the Romanists. Seventh, that not merely a part of Sunday is to be sanctified by the practice of piety, but the whole Sunday, this he held against the Romanists. Eighth, that Sunday in itself is not holier than other days, this he held against the Jews. You may say, what a contentious individual. Mm. Yes, indeed, he contended for the faith once and for all delivered. And like Athanasius, God bless him, he wasn't afraid to stand up and to be counted all alone against the world, if necessary. But he wasn't alone. And I trust he isn't alone today, either. Certainly not in our circles. He further addressed himself to a few pertinent problems. 
and decided, even where someday is regarded as a purely church ordinance, as in Romanism, the duty of Sabbath rest nevertheless remains. Second, Sunday should not be celebrated as early as from Saturday evening onwards, but only from the midnight between Saturday and Sunday onwards. This he held against medieval Romanism, particularly Scottish Romanism, right prior to the Reformation. Uh, he held further that abstention from Sunday labor is not only to avoid giving offense, because Sunday observance is not an indifferent matter at all. According to Fuchsius, Sunday labor must be avoided not only to prevent giving offense, but especially because the commandment is grounded in God's moral law and is no matter of indifference. Fuchsius stoutly denies that it is permissible to purchase goods, to write business letters, to clean out one's house, to go hunting, or to study ordinary arts and sciences, as opposed to theology. I'm not sure we should study theology on Sunday either. On Sunday, as all of these activities, he felt, felt are a hindrance to the exercise of religion. Second, I'd like to draw your attention to Abraham Kuyper, who became Prime Minister of Holland and did much to re-Christianize the de-Christianized Dutch people. Professor in Systematic Theology, Free University of Amsterdam, in the days when that was a great university. He declares in his two works, Goma for the Sabbath and Tract of the Sabbath, that the holy rhythm of one day of rest in relationship to six days of labor is grounded and anchored in the creation work of God himself and must therefore be kept in the life of every man and reflected by every man because every man is the image of God, fallen though that image now is. After the fall, says Kuiper, the Sabbath gradually became obscured, but it did last the longest amongst the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and it was restored amongst the Israelites at Mount Sinai until after the resurrection of Christ with divine authority, when Christ commanded us to celebrate the first day of the week as a Sabbath, that this Sabbath, which now falls on the first day of the week, uh, must be held to be valid in terms of the fourth commandment for as long as life continues on this earth, for all people in this earthly life. Personally, this commandment, says Kuiper, calls upon us uh, to bring to standstill the machinery of our earthly life, inasmuch as the law of nature, the law of necessity, and the law of love, and the needs of the service of the Lord require it on that day, so that our whole soul and all of our senses can be engaged in the holinesses of the Lord in that thus obtained rest. The distinction of the day of the Lord uh, from the other days can be promoted by God's children wearing special clothes that means a nice suit to go to church in rather than a bikini Fisher Toft the World Council of Churches once had this little verse the world church is my delight oh how I love the ecumene but Sunday morning I frequent the beach in my bikini well now that isn't what you and I should do. Even Frisa Toth recognized that. And hopefully we would have a more scriptural position and feeling for the word of God than Frisa Toth. So let's dress up on the Queen of Days for the King of Kings when we go to the house of the Lord. Uh, Kuiper also pointed out that um, Christian citizens should lay aside their daily work on Sunday while they do not do anything guiltlessly which others would regard as inappropriate whereby their weaker brethren may perhaps stumble and be led into sin. Now, Kuyper was followed at the Free University of Amsterdam by an interesting man by the name of Willem Geesink who wrote four massive volumes concerning the ordinances of the Lord. If you want to know why God created bacteria and plants and bolts of lightning, read that book. 
and he'll tell you in, uh, in much erudition. He also says that uh, Sunday is transgressed whenever people seek unsuitable amusements, specifically drunkenness, card playing, dancing, and visiting the theatre. Now, by theatre, he meant particularly the burlesque theatre. But, he said, even amusements and relaxation, which are indeed permissible on other days, are not appropriate on Sunday. For example, all kinds of labour in terms of which we force other people to conduct labour for the sake of allowing us to have amusements, such as holding banquets, when someone's got to be paid to serve us, uh, um, arranging receptions and pleasure cruises. According to Chesink, one should not engage in long bicycle rides, skating competitions, or tourist tours for purposes of relaxation on the Lord's Day. Sending of telegrams, unless they're absolutely necessary, should be left to Monday, because particular time he wrote, they didn't have a mechanized telegraph center. Someone would have to sit there all day and couldn't go to church so that you could write to little Bobby and say, Dear Bobby, this is just to tell you on Sunday, happy birthday, when it's your birthday next Wednesday. That's not necessary. Of course, if your mother's dying, that's a different matter. He further says that journeys on Sunday conducted in public means of conveyance, such as trams and, uh, and trains where someone else has to drive, simply in order to visit your family and friends, as opposed to strengthening them in the things of the Lord, uh, deprives the uh, tram, train, or bus operator of their Sunday rest unnecessarily. The retort often given here, well, after all, the tram driver will be working on Sunday anyway, so why shouldn't I climb on the tram, does not apply, because none of us have any right to participate in sin just because someone else is sinning. And although it is not wrong to use our own means of conveyance, such as an automobile, in order to go to church, it is certainly less desirable that we should even go to church using public means of transport. Unless, of course, we're so poor we can't afford an automobile. Uh, whereas, it is true that in climbing on the bus to go to church on Sunday, we are using the public transportation conveyance in the service of the Lord. It's also true that in so doing, at the same time, we are placing ourselves in the service of the world and promoting things uh, for other purposes that aren't really necessary. And in addition to that, we are being seen on the bus going to church by people uh, who may judge our character on that ground. Now, I flew here last Sunday from Knoxville, Tennessee, after I preached in Knoxville, Tennessee, in order to be able to be here in time to preach on Monday morning. But if my first lecture here had been Monday afternoon, I really think the Lord would have much preferred me to have flown on Monday instead of on Sunday. You may say, well, how fanatical can you get? Well, I think we can get as fanatical as the Bible is. No more and no less. Now then, um, it may well be, concludes Heathens, that there are certain kinds of careers uh, in which activity on Sunday just cannot be brought to a standstill. Uh, one would be cheese manufacture. You can't, like the rabbis, try to prevent the cheeses from continuing to curdle on the Lord's Day. Uh, perhaps blast furnaces in the iron industry. But, even there, says Chesank, it is the duty of the employer to so regulate labor in those professions, to Sunday labor to a minimum, it's the duty of the public to cooperate in his efforts. It's the duty of the laborers themselves to agitate in a constitutional and anti-revolutionary manner and to present the demand for Sunday rest to their employer. And it's the duty of the state to regulate this public morality uh, as far as it can. As a last example of uh, the Sabbath view of a modern conservative Reformed theologian, one who died only in 1950, 
and this is the only South African that I will quote in all these series of lectures in his book The Ten Commandments he points out that it is the French liberal Voltaire who caused the French Revolution who himself said if we can if we wish to oppose the Christian religion in the most powerful and effective manner then we must succeed in undermining and destroying Sabbath sanctification unquote Voltaire Van Royen says the original Sabbath commandment was written on the heart of the still unfallen paradise man on account of the destructive operation of sin after the fall this inscription on his heart gradually became effaced amongst almost all the nations of ancient antiquity but it must be restored because rest Sabbath rest is necessary for man for all man is absolutely necessary for our working powers to be restored otherwise man will only face complete exhaustion and man not only has a body which needs rest and which needs re- um, um, what is the quicken refreshment refreshment but he also has an immortal soul Uh, which cries out for the satisfaction of his deeper requirements and then get this you preachers could you keep it until afterwards please the fourth commandment is now being transgressed in a rougher and rougher manner today Sunday in the 20th century has now become a day of sin more than anything else Sunday is today the day of idleness worldliness but even the preacher can desecrate Sunday by twisting the saving truths of Christianity and falsifying them or by giving and I've heard so many of them indecent unedifying and undeep sermons this form of Sabbath desecration is occurring in the world of the 20th century more and more it is no less serious and God dishonoring than the ordinary man who goes and catches fish on Sunday and so I hope you'll preach to God's glory because the worst form of all Sabbath desecration is the preacher who gets behind a pulpit and says thus says the Lord and promptly says a bunch of things that the Lord never said remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy you too preacher now let's turn to a godly Scots Presbyterian and uh, this is a lovely book Kelman on the Sabbath it was written a hundred years ago I merely read his headings to you it is our duty to have clear and scriptural views of the nature of the Sabbath rest and the purposes for which it was appointed it was appointed for our enjoyment let us enjoy it how erroneous is the view of those who hold that every day is a Sabbath and that no one day is more a Sabbath than every other day true all days should be enjoyable to the Christian but the greatest enjoyment to the Christian is to enjoy the Sabbath how erroneous is the view of those who say that the Sabbath was intended to be a symbol of resting from sin so that after Christ saves us from sin on the cross we no longer have the Sabbath what nonsense he says the Sabbath was instituted in the Garden of Eden before there was sin it is our duty to have clear and scriptural views of the nature of the foundation on which the obligation to observe the weekly Sabbath rests first we must avoid the theory which represents the Lord's day as a new ordinance wholly distinct from the Old Testament Sabbath having nothing to do with the fourth commandment second we must avoid the theory which represents the Lord's day as a purely church institution thus Rome and the obligation to observe it is based upon the decrees of the church or the customs of its denomination and not on the Bible third it is our duty to have clear and scriptural views of the way in which the Sabbath should be kept and to observe the Sabbath accordingly two opposite extremes should be avoided on the one hand we should avoid an undue rigor more rigorous than the Bible I know some people in South Africa and I say it to my shame who shut up put shutters in front of a window on the Lord's day 
Seventh day Adventists appropriately pointed out, you people say you keep Sunday because the Lord hath risen and the light come back into the world. Why are you keeping the light out? Well said. Well said. But, and I think this is true of America, there's also the opposite heresy of undue laxity in keeping the Sabbath. And it's no less pernicious, perhaps even more so. There are two other mistakes which must be guarded against. First, there is a mistake of those who put means in place of the end. We don't keep Sabbath because we worship the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath as a means to the end of serving God. We don't sit still afraid to breathe on the Sabbath like the Jewish Hasidim. But we use the Sabbath with liberty and with sincerity to serve and to enjoy our God. Second, there's the mistake of those who give too much or too exclusive a prominence to the merely negative aspect of Sabbath observance. Thou shalt not do this and don't do this and don't do this. That's necessary, but we've also got to say, do this and do this and do this and enjoy God. Be in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, particularly, may I say, in dealing with our children. To be more specific, right Sabbath keeping involves the performance of various directly religious duties. Some of the private some of the public kind. Public kind, go to church with your family. Private kind, spend the Sunday afternoon with your family. Uh, play Bible games with your little children. Don't be too rigorous. Don't be too lax. Delight in their company. Walk in your garden. Admire the flowers that the Lord hath made. Pretend you're Adam and Eve walking on the first Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. There must be a cessation from all merely worldly employment, says Kelman, whether in the form of work or of recreation. The lawfulness of such works as are necessary for the purpose of which the Sabbath was appointed may go. Works of religion. Preacher, preach that sermon and sweat. It's hard work, but that's appropriate. And if you don't sweat when you're preaching a sermon, you're desecrating the Sabbath. Conduct works of mercy. Lift an animal out of a ditch into which it's fallen. Heal people in hospitals. Prepare food if it's really necessary, but try and get most of it prepared on Saturday night. There are also certain works which, though not so directly necessary for the purpose of God's rest, are yet necessary for the maintenance of the system of things as a whole, such as, and here's a good Scott, he hasn't signed the pledge, uh, works necessary for maintaining breweries and iron furnaces. Then he says after that there's some jobs in which a Christian should never be involved but doesn't specify what they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we must distinguish between doing things in an emergency and doing them in the ordinary course of events. David, when his life was in danger, did flee from Saul to Nob on the Sabbath day. We must also distinguish between doing things for worldly ends to serve worldly purposes. The case of the priests in the temple is sufficient illustration again. We must also distinguish between works done for purposes belonging to the Sabbath day itself and works done for purposes belonging to the secularities of the other day of the week, days of the week. We must not only keep the Sabbath for ourselves, but we must seek that others too, particularly our servants, may enjoy the same privileges. We must consider the influence which our example may have on others and regulate our conduct accordingly. Of course, one should apply that to the breweries too, not so. The whole day should be spent as in connection with God's blessed rest, in laying ourselves down to sleep, in partaking of the gifts of God's bounty, in engaging in religious exercises we should ever have in view the great object of realizing fellowship with God in his rest. He says, I can't go into all the details, but he does go into some. Feasting in company, it's all right, provided you're not paying for it, and provided you use that opportunity to turn the conversation to spiritual subjects. Amusements, avoid them. They turn the mind away from God and detain it with worldly things. Get your amusement in the other six days of the week. Walking, it depends, he says. Walking to church, that's fine. Walking far to church and exhausting yourself if you can go by horse, take the horse, but don't wear out the horse because your horse and your ox and your ass should rest like you too. 
rich man who got a nice garden you can walk in six days a week stay out of the garden on the Sabbath day apartment dweller with no garden at all and no time to visit the garden go to a public park on the Lord's day he says don't walk too far admire the flowers but don't pay admission fee to go into the park and those who would condemn people for walking in a park who live in an apartment six days a week have obviously never lived in an apartment he says using conveyances to the minimum he'd say today using your own auto okay using trains avoid them and certainly don't operate goods trains on the Sabbath except in case of dire emergency or warfare it's our duty to do what we can and this is where you fellows come in to disseminate sound and scriptural views respecting the Sabbath not to avoid these issues because we erroneously think that half the people will get up and walk out and watch their TV sets and never come back to our church they won't some will the Lord will honor you and bring in twice as many people as you ever had before so has been my experience well so much for Kelman now let me wind this up in a few minutes that we've got left a couple of words from this uh, book of Murray taught in Philadelphia for years the Deuteronomy Decalogue says that redeemed people he says who've been redeemed and brought out of bondage by the mercies of the Lord should out of gratitude keep the Sabbath and so you see if Christ has redeemed us we out of gratitude should keep the Sabbath then on the last page redemption has a past a present and a future context in the Sabbath is the Lord's day all three are focused in retrospect the Sabbath is a memorial of our Lord's resurrection in the present with resurrection joy the Sabbath fulfills its beneficent design by the Lordship of the Son of Man as prospect it is the promise of the inheritance of the saints with varying degrees of understanding and application it is this perspective that dictated the observance of the Lord's Day in Catholic, Protestant and Reformed tradition. Shall we forfeit an institution so embedded in redemptive revelation and so recognized as such in the history of the Church of Christ? In the faith and for the honor of the Sab Sabbath's Lord, may we answer with a decisive no! And may Covenant Seminary not be second to Westminster Seminary on this point. In devotion to the Lord, may we increasingly know the joy and the blessing of the recurring day of rest and worship. Now the spirit in which, this is me now, not Murray, the spirit in which the fourth commandment should be held is very important. The commandment does not determine that all labor must cease, for the sake of the cessation of labor but rather that it should cease as much as possible so that the Sabbath day can then unhinderedly thereby be dedicated to God and his service in other words we do not sanctify the Sabbath simply by not doing any work but we cease from as much work as possible so that we can sanctify the Sabbath in other words the Sabbath rest is necessary for the more important phase of Sabbath consecration and not the other way round. The Pharisees never understood this. They thought that man had been created for the sake of Sabbath and of Sabbath rest. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ uh, showed them through his own behavior that the Sabbath and Sabbath sanctification has been given by God for the sake of man and that works of mercy, such as healing, Mark 3, works of religion such as temple service Matthew 12 works of necessity such as holy war Joshua 6 are not only no transgression of the fourth commandment but the fourth commandment actually requires them so that you break the fourth commandment if you don't do these things on the Sabbath day John 5 the uh, position of some antinomians that Christ on occasion broke the Sabbath is ridiculous if our Savior ever broke the Sabbath the Ten Commandments have not been perfectly held for us then God's requirements have not been met then we're yet in our sin and we're lost the way to keep the fourth commandment is the way in which Jesus kept it because he kept it 
and we are to follow his example. Let me read you, uh, in winding this up, just one or two more passages, and then I think we'll call it a day, or a morning rather. Today the Sabbath, I'm insane, should be held just as much as in all previous times, with the exception of the now fulfilled period of the ceremonial laws of Moses. Because the Sabbath is a moral obligation instituted by God for all peoples of all times. This means that the Sabbath must still be observed according to the biblical provisions. That is, that we and our servants should rest on the Sabbath and think of God and his works of creation and redemption. And that all labor which is not absolutely necessary or merciful be avoided on the Sabbath. The Sabbath should not be used for our own affairs and idle talk and pleasure. The Sabbath is also the day of the assembly of the believers, the day on which no unnecessary preparation of food or traveling or even exhaustion of animals should take place. The day of our restraining ourselves from all evil. Well now, the Westminster uh, larger catechism, I believe, um, summarizes this very beautiful, beautifully in question 117. How is the Sabbath to be kept? By a holy resting all of that day. Not only from such works as are at all times sinful, but even from such worldly employments and recreations, that's the football match, as are on other days lawful. And making it our delight to spend the whole time, except as much of it as is to be taken up in works of necessity and mercy, in the public and private exercises of God's worship. To that end, we are to prepare our hearts and our food, that's me, with such foresight, diligence and moderation to dispose seasonably and dispatch our worldly business beforehand so that we may be the more free and fit for the duties of the Sabbath day. The sins forbidden in the fourth commandment are all omissions of the duties required, question 119, all careless, negligent and unprofitable performing of them and being weary of doing them, all profaning of the Sabbath by idleness and doing that which is in itself sinful and by all needless works, words and thoughts about our worldly employments and recreations. Well now, I think it is clear from this that the whole of the Lord's day should be kept to his glory. There are indeed works of necessity such as that of the police, works of mercy such as the hospitals, works of religion such as preaching. There are also works which cannot be interrupted such as supplying electricity, the hotel industry, intercontinental ocean liners and the operation of dairies particularly for the sake of cows. All of which will have to be attended to on Sundays. But even here, and this is a solution, I think, the employer, the Christian employer, should accommodate his workers by seeing to it that they are released from labor at least every second Sunday. Stagger the shifts. And that they are also given, and this isn't done, an extra weekday off as a day of rest as compensation for that Sunday on which they were required to work. Further, each must decide for himself what may and may not be done on God's holy day, but he himself must refrain from even legitimate but uncommanded pursuits, such as swimming at the beach, wearing unbecoming clothes, which may cause his weaker brother to stumble, and so cause the latter to desecrate the Sabbath. All Sunday trading, such as buying gas, even in order to travel to church, get that done Saturday, purchasing Sunday newspapers, reading Saturday newspapers on Sunday, patronizing restaurants and public swimming baths on Sunday, thus forcing the poor gas station attendant, newspaper vendor, waitress, or swimming bath ticket seller to sacrifice their essential Sabbath rest for our own non-essential Sabbath desecrating convenience by our unnecessary patronizing of their unscrupulous employers, all of this should be firmly avoided. Even many worthwhile activities recommendable on other days of the week, such as visiting friends for purely social reasons as opposed to talking about Christ with them, 
swimming, hiking, picnicking, except if you have no garden to go into a park in respect of which you don't have to pay money and admire the flowers and admire God when you're admiring the flowers during your picnic. Fishing and reading educational, though non-religious books and magazines should not be indulged in on the Lord's Day. After all, my last sentence, it's the Lord's Day and not ours. It's his day and it must be hallowed. Like St. John, we too should be in the spirit on the Lord's Day and not in the flesh. For like the Apostle John on the Lord's Day, we too should not only look back to the day of God's creation rest, nor just look back to Easter Sunday resurrection of Jesus, but we should also look forward constantly week by week to that day to which all Lord's Days point, the day of the Lord. Even so, amen. Come Lord Jesus.